research, how the project has impacted their research, and then what we really want to do is uh, open this up for conversation uh, to try to synthesize what's gone on today, which has been, I think, really, really interesting. So. Okay. Um, on, first, I'm going to give a brief introduction to our, our the three of us, the round table here, and then, uh, then I'm going to shift into uh, talking to my own part here. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you again for coming today, especially you, you diehards who are here at the end of the, of the day on Friday. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks again to the Center for 21st Century Studies. Um, as Mine laid out in the introduction, um, one, of the, one sense of contested ecologies, uh, perhaps most immediate, is uh, the, that of the actual, the real world contested ecologies that many of us are familiar with. Differing and conflicting visions of how the futures of particular ecosystems constituted in particular places and at particular scales might take shape. And the second sense of contested ecologies is particularly important for the consideration of transdisciplinarity. Uh, that is, contested ways of producing and representing knowledge about these real world contested ecosystems. Of course, ever since the, the term was coined in the 19th century, ecology has been in many ways transdisciplinary or at least interdisciplinary. Uh, and even within the field of ecology more narrowly defined, uh, there has been plenty of contestation. Uh, a few of you here were uh, in a seminar with me last year where we read uh, Arthur Tansley's article, uh, The Use and Abuse of Vegetational Concepts and Terms, which uh, contested the then dominant climax theory of succession and plant ecology, uh, and that and went on to influence the urban ecology that was practiced by Chicago sociologists. But in that article, Tansley also planted the seeds uh, for another kind of contested ecology, which is of particular relevance to the discussions today. Uh, that is challenging the focus of other ecologists on so-called natural community. Tansley insisted that ecology needed to encompass the human influence as well. Or as he succinctly and rather provocatively, I think, put it, human activity finds its proper place in ecology. And indeed, in the early years of the 21st century, it would appear that human activity is indeed finding its place in ecology. I'll say more about that in a little bit. But the problem, exactly how to bring the humans back in to ecology has proven to be a vexing problem. And it may be no coincidence that the social sciences and humanities have been grappling with the equally vexing problem of how to bring the non-humans back in at exactly the same time. You can look no further than last year's non-human turn conference here at the center for a great example. Um, for example, do we bring humans back in as rational individual actors seeking to maximize utility? Do we bring them back in as collectives, as classes struggling for hegemony? Uh, do we add them just to increasingly sophisticated models designed to stimulate and represent socio-ecological systems? Or do we follow the, the theoretical trends in social sciences and humanities that have so deeply challenged what it means to be human in the first place and have cast out on the capacity of simply representing human activity in models or otherwise. These, as we've discovered, are not easy questions to answer. Now I'm going to shift gears and move into my own uh, presentation here. I have two main goals for this, uh, which I'll try to keep very brief. Uh, first, I want to give you a short introduction to the empirical research that this grant and partnership have kickstarted for me and for the graduate students who are working with me. Second, I want to revisit a couple of the themes uh, that I've just mentioned uh, just now. Specifically, I'd like to talk about how we're attempting to address the peril and the promise of transdisciplinarity with respect to a range of contested urban ecologies, some of which are also distinguished as transboundary urban ecologies. My basic contention here is that the very characteristic that calls for transdisciplinarity, that is the fact that urban ecological change, the apprehension of which requires the expertise of the natural sciences, is driven or influenced by competing human interests, values, meanings, some of the things that we've gotten a sense of today, the conventional domain of the humanities and social sciences. And it, this is at the same time the characteristic that presents the biggest challenge for transdisciplinarity, at least in the sense that uh, we've been trying to uh, discuss here. I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but again, I'd like to start by uh, highlighting some of our empirical research. One of the best things that this challenge grant has enabled me to do is provide research assistance support for two of my PhD students, Katie Williams and Ryan Covington, who's not able to be here today. Uh, but this hasn't been a matter of simply supporting their individual projects. It's pushed our projects in new directions, and it's enabled us to develop a collaborative, comparative analysis that we wouldn't have been able to undertake individually. As we mentioned today, one of the central themes in our original grant proposal 
was the role of borders and boundaries. For me, Katie, and Ryan, the topic that we coalesced around was the place of borders and boundaries in environmental governance, and particularly in stakeholder participation. Katie's research is close to home, uh, focusing on stakeholder participation in Great Lakes areas of concern. And if you haven't heard of these, these are sites designated as toxic hotspots by the uh, 1987 amendments to the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the US and Canada. The main task of each of these areas of concern is to develop a remedial action plan to have the area delisted based on eliminating adverse impacts known as beneficial use impairments. Another way to view these plans is as efforts to restore highly compromised freshwater ecologies. In all of these cases, various stakeholders have been enlisted to help develop and implement the action plans, and the way this happens is the focus of her project. In addition to the Milwaukee estuary area of concern here in town, uh, Katie has been focusing on two other case studies in which different kinds of boundaries play a central role. First, the binational St. Mary's River area of concern, straddling the border between the U.S. and Canada near Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Michigan, and Ontario, and also running through, this doesn't show on this map here, it's the one in the, uh, your upper left-hand side, uh, the small Garden River First Nations Reserve a few miles east of Sault Ste. Marie, and second, the St. Louis River area of concern, which lies along the boundary dividing Minnesota and Wisconsin in the Duluth Superior, uh, and also intersects the reservation of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, one of the themes Katie's investigating here uh, is regulatory and jurisdictional complexity. When areas of concern and watersheds intersect multiple political boundaries, what are the implications for the rules and expectations for stakeholder engagement and participation? One of the interesting findings she's uh, been discussing with, uh, with us lately here is that in some ways the boundaries of the tribal territories are presenting more complications for stakeholder participation than the international boundary at the St. Mary's but in very different ways in the two cases because of the very different relationships between reservations or reserves, uh, states and provinces, and federal governments in the two countries. For example, the Fond du Lac Band has its own coordinator involved with the Remedial Action Plan at the St. Louis River, but there's been little to no effort to include the Garden River Reserve in the process at St. Mary's in Canada. Um, uh, another is the borders and boundaries themselves. Do they act as barriers to participation? As we might expect, the international boundary complicates stakeholder participation in ways that it wouldn't in Milwaukee or Duluth Superior. Uh, it can be a time-consuming ordeal to attend meetings when you have to pass through customs to do it. Uh, but Katie's finding that there's subtle ways that even the state line is inhibiting stakeholder participation. I'm not going to don't have time to go into those here, but uh, there's some very interesting findings there. In addition to this case study research, uh, Katie and I, with the assistance and collaboration of staff at the Great Lakes National Program Office in Chicago, have actually drafted a survey for uh, RAP coordinators, this is the Remedial Action Plan, uh, more acronyms, uh, at the U.S. Areas of Concern, which we expect to administer this summer. Uh, this survey is going to focus on barriers to stakeholder participation, and we're trying to use it, along with follow-up interviews, to get a broader sense of whether and how boundaries of various kinds complicate this process. Meanwhile, Ryan Covington is down in Balmy Savannah this year. Uh, we have Skype conversations with him when we, we see him in t-shirts and the sun outside. It's very frustrating. Investigating the huge Savannah River Harbor Expansion Project, a controversial project to deepen the river channel in order to accommodate massive new ships that are expected to arrive after the Panama Canal expansion next year. Here, too, stakeholder participation is one of the central themes of the research. And there's some intriguing overlaps, especially with the St. Louis River case that Katie's looking at. In each case, the river forms a state boundary. Uh, and one of the key stakes in each is the protection and restoration of wildlife habitats, both within and alongside the river. You can see here the St. Savannah National Wildlife Refuge up in the upper left-hand corner. Also, uh, there's the Tybee uh, National Wildlife Refuge a few miles downstream of this big project. But in contrast to the Great Lakes AOCs, in Savannah, stakeholder participation has been the topic of very big, well-publicized controversy. There had been a large stakeholder group, including numerous federal and state agencies, alongside nonprofits and other organizations, established to evaluate the environmental impact statements for the harbor expansion project. However, their role was subordinate to the Georgia Ports Authority. Uh, you talk about translating ecological values and economic values is a good example here. Uh, and eventually, mistrust of the Ports Authority's motives led the stakeholder group effectively to dissolve. 
uh, on top of this is the intensive, uh, I'll just briefly add, is the intensely competitive relationship between Georgia and South Carolina, both of whom are trying to compete for that port traffic. Charleston's just up the road here, too. Among other things, Ryan is tracing the processes through which the dissolution of the stakeholder group has taken place. But the three of us are also collaborating in a comparative analysis of the two cases, focusing on the different institutional mixes, different roles of borders and boundaries, and stakeholder participation in the two locations. Uh, and one of the things, Katie and Ryan organized a paper session, series of paper sessions uh, that's going to be uh, going on next week at the Association of American Geographers. Uh, and Katie will be presenting some of the initial comparative analysis there on Wednesday. Now, to return briefly to the other theme of this paper, again, I'm contending that the fact that we're dealing with these heterogeneous associations of humans and non-humans, these socio-ecological uh, so assemblages here, requires a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, we need the natural sciences to account for ecological change. We need the social sciences and the humanities to account for the human interests, values, desires that drive this ecological change. However, the challenge of transdisciplinarity suggests that the, 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 the challenge of trying to create something new that somehow goes beyond these disciplines uh, suggests that we can't simply add the human element to models of ecological systems or conversely to subsume ecological systems under one social theory or another. Not only would this be to impose what some have called epistemological sovereignty, according to some scholars, a hallmark of interdisciplinarity, and we can say more about that in the question if you would like, but it would also run the risks of dismissing pluralism in the favor of some kind of synthesis that might have contradictory fundamental assumptions. I'll say a bit more about this with reference to another project this grant has catalyzed and supported, an investigation of historical and contemporary processes shaping ecological and social change along Milwaukee's rivers. Uh, for part of this, I'm also collaborating with another of my graduate students, Nick Schulke, whose thesis research is investigating neighborhood change in Lincoln Village, through which the notoriously channelized and straightened Kinnickinick uh, segment of the Kinnickinick River runs. Um, one of the things we're trying to do here is to set up a transdisciplinary engagement between two very different ways of conceptualizing how this river has changed. One, usually just called urban ecology, has come out of systems ecology, and the aim is to try to find ways to bring humans in to formal models of socio-ecological systems like these. The other, urban political ecology, has its roots in Marxist geography, and one of its objectives has been to find ways to bring non-humans in to political economic analyses of urban change. To complicate things further, much urban political ecology also takes inspiration from a decidedly non-Marxist approach actor network theory, which emphasizes, among other things, the agency of non-humans of various kinds, the distinctive roles of scientists in the sciences, and the circulation of the metrics and standards that make ecological knowledge possible in the first place. Again, this is something we can talk about more if you're interested, don't have the time to go into it here. The problem is, at least as we're arguing, that these approaches carry conflicting assumptions. So far, the big teams carrying out urban ecological research using these frameworks here have largely done so within the socio-ecological systems paradigm, and social scientists involved in these teams have generally used analytical approaches that start with the choices of individuals, including households, firms, organizations, etc., frequently, although not always, conceived of as rational utility maximizers. In addition, their approach to space and spatiality is coming primarily out of ecology. Specifically, what we're seeing in some of these big projects are efforts to extend the concept of patch dynamics an approach to spatial heterogeneity among plant and animal communities and landscape ecology to human or social heterogeneity. I can't go into detail about this here, but one of the risks that we're attending to here is the risk of naturalizing, perhaps, the production of spatial heterogeneity within human communities. In contrast, urban political ecology focuses analytically not on the choices of individuals, but on such things as the process of capital accumulation or political struggles for hegemony. And as for space and spatiality, urban political ecology conceives of spatial heterogeneity not as the outcome of a kind of natural process, but as the product of historical and highly politicized processes. I'll finish here briefly by introducing a couple of empirical cases coming out of this line of thinking. Uh, in the case of the KK River, uh, what we've begun to do is trace the historical processes through which the river has been transformed and continues to be transformed. First, in its renaturalization during the 1930s up in the upper uh, left-hand corner, when capital and labor from New Deal programs flowed directly into the construction of a new physical environment. Second, its channelization 
down here in the corner, which began not long after a massive flood at the end of March 1960. And third, the present day dismantlement of the concrete channels and an apparent return to the older vision of renaturalization. And that's a vision of the future of the Connecticut right there. On the one hand, we need a transdisciplinary engagement with ecological sciences so that we can account for actual physical changes in the ecologies of the river. Uh, but on the other, we're using the case to challenge the way in which mainstream urban ecology has conceptualized human activity. Uh, each of these ecological transformations has been politically contested. And we're arguing that these political transformations cannot be easily incorporated into the particular models of systems that, we've, that have animated the recent uh, urban ecology. Another case, just briefly, I'm examining as part of this project is the Milwaukee River just upstream of the Estabrook Dam. Here, too, we saw the production of a new ecology in the 1930s when the dam was built. Over the past year, a controversy has emerged over the future of the dam, which, of course, has deteriorated significantly. On the one side, we have the Milwaukee Riverkeeper, a leading voice calling for it to be removed uh, in order to help recreate the Milwaukee River as an ecosystem with free flowing waters and easy fish passage. However, it's met with opposition from the Milwaukee River Hilton and many homeowners upstream in Glendale. You can still see a lot of these signs uh, along the river in Glendale. They want to preserve the current impoundment eco ecosystem and the assemblages of opportunities and values that it provides. So if the promise of transdisciplinarity in, this, in the study of contested ecologies is that it brings together those who have specialized in the workings of the non-human world and now seek to bring humans in, and those who have specialized in the workings of the human world and now seek to bring non-humans in, one of the perils is that figuring out how to do this is much more difficult than it first appeared to be. Again, mainstream urban ecology has taken what I call an interdisciplinary path seeking to absorb human activity into models of systems. Although this offers undeniable analytical possibilities, it also runs this risk of naturalizing this human activity rather than recognizing it not only as political and contingent, but it also as resistant to ready representation. It also fails to recognize the overwhelming pluralism within the social sciences and humanities with respect to how to conceptualize the human and the social, gravitating often towards the approaches most conducive to existing models. At this point, I have more questions than answers. I anticipate that the task of figuring out what a transdisciplinary pluralist approach to contested urban ecology what it looks like is going to occupy us for years to come, even though, of course, there are these handy diagrams that we return to. But if one of the most gratifying benefits has been, has been uh, for me has been the ways in which it has supported the work uh, and stimulated the work of these graduate students in our partnerships. The fact that it's raised these questions is surely another. I'll just close briefly to, with some thanks again to Richard and Mary uh, for making this grant program and symposium possible, uh, to Tim and Mona for the many productive conversations that have pushed these projects forward, to Ryan, Katie, and Nick for their hard work on research collaboration, to others who have provided research assistance, including Joy Nielsen, the staff of the AGS Library, Nadia Bogue, and the EPA Great Lakes National Program Office. Okay, thank you.
Okay, uh, I just want to start off by saying that I would really like to thank all the students in the BMC program. Uh, a number of them have been working with me uh, and my rather impassioned way of thinking about, uh, about the river Oxus, the Amudarya in Central Asia. Several of them have lent hours of their work trying to figure out information sources and so forth. Uh, and most of them are in this room already. I'd also like to thank a few undergraduate South students who have actually made some of the graphic devices we are employing in this particular presentation possible. Uh, and why I emphasize so much on the graphic devices is because many years ago when I got interested in South Asia, I was looking at the architecture of that particular region. Uh, and then a few years ago, uh, I got interested in the river itself, the Grand River in Central Asia, which in fact is somehow the river that tells us all the stories about the place. And I realized that one of the most important tasks is to map the river. In order to understand the river, one has to map it. Uh, but in some ways, it's an unmappable entity because it's actually at the border between Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. It's never been mapped before, except in regular cartographic surveys, uh, but it's never really drawn any attention. I also discovered that these maps were in some ways very simple two-dimensional descriptions. So I wanted to do something that would, that would actually allow me to uh, come to terms with a new way of looking at this particular information. So uh, at that very point in time, the, the grant from C21 came up, and I was very thankful for that. Uh, and we divided our work on mapping into four parts, and we're still doing it as we speak. Uh, the first was mapping history, the second was mapping landscape, the third was mapping journey, and the fourth was mapping conflict. And we've heard about the last one about mapping conflict, but how do you map it in a way that in some ways it adds on to the other layers? Now while this is happening, while we're doing this, in no way does this preclude us, remove us from thinking about the scenarios of what will happen if at all, Central Asia, if this particular geographical entity were to be studied in great detail and uh, all the information about it could be brought out, how would that begin to affect the way in which Central Asian geographies uh, could be re-examined? So my paper is titled, Rivery, Borderlands, and Intertwined Histories Along the Amudarya. And uh, it has uh, slides here. Some of them are animations and some of them are regular slides. And I will try to paraphrase exactly what the slides are about. Most of them are self-animated, and they will be about the way we map the landscape. We communicate the quality of it and the loneliness of it as people cross from one side to the other. David Christen's Maps of Time, an introduction to big history, unites the fields of natural history and human history in a single, intelligible narrative. In its superlative attempt to create an overarching umbrella of knowledge, it is perhaps analogous to Isaac Newton's universal laws of motion, or perhaps to Darwin's now controversial examination of life forms within the arc of a single evolutionary process. It is precisely via the exemplar of interwoven small, medium, large, and extra large scales, which I call as SML XL, posited alongside the structure of a Brodelian long durée, tacitly inherent in Christian's work that I interrogate the hows and the whys of contested ecologies. How do these space-time conditions get engaged to larger scenarios beyond their own seeming micro-events? I also look at Clifford Gertz, the so-called purveyor of small things, who in his thick descriptions of cultures and societies sets up a methodology to, to, to draw a phenomena in sufficient detail, allowing translation and transfer to other times, settings, situations, and people. Finally, in capacity as a map maker, cartographer at large, as I call myself, more figuratively and in borrowing liberally from philosopher Gilbert Riley, my work is intended not merely to increase what we already know about places, but to rectify the logical geographies of the knowledge that we already possess about these places. Contested ecologies and borderlands created by these contentious space-time configurations come under the purview of what Bruno Latour calls hybrid systems, varying biophysical environments, politics, policies, technologies, values, meanings, and its histories 
are thoroughly entangled and intertwined. In other words, they facilitate no easy readings, nor direct answers. It is on these lines that we seek unique ways to combine our different expertise of globally removed regions via new modes of transdisciplinary research beyond disciplinary boundaries, and the design possibilities of encounters between system modeling approaches in the physical sciences alongside qualitative hermeneutic approaches inherent to the humanities. Three disciplinary fields brought us together, architecture, urban studies, geography, and the biological sciences. Given my humble expertise in the first mention of these areas, not so much as a practitioner, much to the chagrin of my professional colleagues, but rather as a figurative cartographer, I discard the architect's frequently exaggerated role as a problem solver of past generations. Instead, viewing architecture and urban studies to re-explore and redefine seminal questions of what constitutes place, space, and culture. The rapidly glo globalizing world has compelled my field to address complex issues that require a qualitative, not just quantitative shift. No longer is there one strand of privileged history, but now several. The significant shift characterized as the, as the integration of knowledge is a direct outcome of the redefinition of the object under study, in this case the river, carried out within the framework of the fundamental unity underlying all forms of knowledge. It is this framework that constitutes the theoretical background of the transdisciplinary dimension in architecture, an intellectual space where the nature of manifold links among seemingly isolated issues of conflict along border ecologies can now be revealed. Now in the uh, animation that you're seeing here, we are talking about history, the history of the river, uh, the cultural processes that happened over time, the way in which uh, the, the Arab Ridda warfares unleashed a very large population of soldiers to come to this particular part of the world and thereafter to cross the river and go to the other side. It also talks about, beginning with this particular illustration, the nature of cities in Central Asia, <coughs> what they were prior to the arrival of the Arabs, and what they became after the arrival of the Arabs. Cities which were, in some ways, uh, schemas that were geometric, rectangular, square, or circular, became rather special by the addition of certain characteristics on their periphery, which in the Arabic literature was called the Rabah, or suburbia. So we, in fact, think about suburbia as something that happened in the 20th century. Here I discovered suburbia that was actually happening all the way back between the 7th and the 11th centuries. Uh, now the next part of this animation is going to talk about uh, the, the, the way in which uh, you actually saw these new city models in the region of Central Asia and a few diagrams on that. So the East Iranian city or the traditional Central Asian city and the way the Central Asian grew, a city grew following the invasions on that part of the world when the Arab forces crossed the river and interacted with the Persian populations. So the city on the rightmost side, which is a city in suburbia, as I call it. To begin discussion on the Eurasian lifeline represented by the Oxus River, I turn attention to political machinations. When did the Oxus begin to define a border or the border within Central Asia? And here you begin to see the journeys that uh, the Arab soldiers actually took across the river, several of them marked by these dashed lines, which are no longer extant cities but archaeological sites as you go from one side of the river to the other. And here you, you see the 38 volumes of uh, the historian Al Tabari who was writing in the 10th century and documenting the process of these invasions of this particular part of the world. Now, this fascination in trying to unravel history, in trying to diagram history, and then correlate it to geographical truisms is something that I was trying to do in this particular project. The answers to why the Oxus River uh, should be looked at and redefined as a border boundary condition are complex. Within Central Asia itself, in geographical terms, uh, while the region was well defined by its physical features, including mountains, seas, and land masses, 
Culturally and historically, it remained fluid and continuous. Even in antiquity, the mercurial oxus was an impressive line of demarcation, one separating the northeastern steppe from the southwestern desert. It was negotiated by the ancient Greeks, then the Indo-Chinese Kushans, the Heptolites, and thereafter the nomadic Turks. Following the Riddha Wars and Arabia Felix, the Arab armies crossed the Oxus in 673 CE. The quick raids of early years were followed by sustained expeditions by 700, culminating in decisive control and habitation of Eurasia's urban centers by 750. For the Arab armies crossing the Oxus, now called the Jaipur in Arabic, symbolized great glory, unchallenged access to the riches of the prosperous region of Mawala Nair. Yet beyond its role as a geographical barrier, the Oxus had also long served as a distinct, yet permeable cultural boundary, situated strategically at a global borderland separating Persia from Central Asia. It had existed as a real frontier for human movements, a barrier that separated, yet inherently connected, the Arab and the Persian realms. If its east-west span of more than 1,500 miles served as one conspicuous feature of this intimidating rivery frontier, the selective points of its variable crossings only exaggerated its formidability. Not that it was impassable elsewhere, but rather that in historical terms, these crossing points served as cultural crucibles and definitive paths to the most important cities of the region. If indeed, therefore, a critical biography of this rivery borderland should be written, it would be an evocative biography of no places and the people who no longer live there. In other words, non-spaces and nameless migrants. Little happened on the Oxus itself, where the meandering banks changed treacherously, save for a series of nondescript, inconsequential towns of no special significance. Indeed, much of the action appears to have emanated from and affected territories that lay to the southwest and the northeast of the Oxus itself including the legendary cities of Samarkand, Bukhara, Penjikan, Mel, and Termez, with their characteristic Rabat, or suburbia. And here you can begin to see all the cities on both sides of the river. Closer to you, closer to the bottom, would be Turkmenistan, and towards the top would be Uzbekistan. And you would be crossing from the southwest to the northeast. And what's actually quite compelling in this, in this simplified description is the way in which the distances from the river in some ways show the size of the cities, their prominence. Uh, some of the biggest cities are not close to the river, like what you would normally expect, but they're actually far away from the river. In fact, it seems if you analyze the Arab invasions between the 7th and the 10th centuries, you realize that very few of the larger invasions actually happened in cities that lay close to the river. It is within this broad purview of radical cultural and ethnic change and the decisive shift from nomadism to settled lifestyles that the Oxus must be reconsidered. The river borders served as, as an astonishing natural feature within the otherwise relentless, flat, semi-arid desert landscape of Eurasia. Al-Tabari's writing, who I've already mentioned to you, with his 38 wonderful volumes that document the Arab invasions, described the Arab forces uh, as mainly approaching the river from the southwest traveling across the bleak desert waste from the grand city of Mel, uh, which is in current day Turkmenistan, the launching base for their many expeditions across the river. This geographical divide was crossed at the city of Charjui, or ancient Amul, employing pantoons, platforms, and boats. Today, Charjui still remains as one of four international crossing points connecting Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, though today transformed as the modern Chadzu for the Uzbeks, and Turkmenabad for the Turkomans. Within this landscape, the mighty Oxus as it, as it appeared quite suddenly for the very travelers, flowing between the Karakum, the desert of the Black Sands to the west, and the Kizilkum, or the desert of the Red Sands to the east. There was little irrigation, even fewer settlements, as the river carved and meandered its way through a particularly desert, uh, desolate and unpeopled landscape. Central Asia therefore literally represented the intersection of two kinds of cultural traditions. And here I'm showing you maps uh, that we have discovered in the archives, including uh, a series of maps from uh, declassified uh, Russian military uh, uh, repository. 
which we put together in order to study the topographical features of this particular river. Central Asia therefore literally represented the intersection of two kinds of cultural conditions, the nomadic with the sedentary, with the Amudarya serving as a fractured zone between the two, for the advanced, advancing medieval Arab and significantly non-Arab forces, while the region of Khorasan, with the Amudarya forming its northeastern edge, was a frontier land, an active bulwark against the enemies of Islam, whether Iranians or Turks. It was nonetheless a zone of negotiation. While frontier still remains the best English term to describe this contentious boundary, medieval Arab sources actually employ a multitude of terms, including Fadra, Had, Nib, and Abbasid, as a boundary between territories. In this case, one separating the Dar al-Islam from the Dar al-Had, literally the abode of Islam from the world of the enemy. This so-called enemy terrain was a surprising cultural condenser of negotiation, mediation, and cross-cultural ethnic trans-civilizational sharing, at least for the multitude of Eurasian nomadic groups who crossed the river for several centuries until the 1700s. And the slides here are showing you the two crossing points on the river that have historically remained the same crossing points since the beginning of time. Complex descriptions impacted this historical memory of migration and geography with the extension of Russian control over Eurasia beginning in the 1870s. Initiated by the Bolsheviks, Eurasia's internal borders were arbitrary, arbitrarily delineated by Soviet bureaucrats in Moscow in the early 1920s. Lenin, in his letter to the communists of Turkestan, asked them to investigate how many states Central Asia ought to have and what these should be named. So in the slides that you're seeing, this vast continuity of space was once and for all completely erased. While the idea of sovereign and independent ethnic-based states was largely alien and exotic for the locals, even the conception of a divided Turkestan was unthinkable at this point. Vasily Bartol, a well-known Central Asian scholar in the 1920s, warned them that Central Asia had no historic experience of the paradigm of an ethnic state. And it would be a great, it would be a grave error to divide the region along ethnic lines, specifically via superficial borders that leverage the apparent divisiveness of geographical separators, such as the Oxus River that ran across the heart of Central Asia. And one of the reasons why some of the descriptions are coming to you is because I would like to show what that region would look like sans boundaries. Bartold, uh, our historian, also recognized that the terms borders and boundaries in Eurasia's uniquely nomadic condition were anomalies, and given the Amudarya's role as a cultural unifier, should be replaced with the term territory. And we are coming to the city of Bukhara here, uh, which is one of the many cities along the Oxus River that was occupied by the Arab armies and it was added upon. And we are beginning to see a reconstruction of the citadel at the center of the city, which is now in ruins, but we have actually put together historical maps to reconstruct what the city must have been at a particular point in time. Nevertheless, little of this sentiment to keep the area as one was seriously entertained when the Turkestan Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic created from Turkestan Krai of Imperial Russia in 1924 uh, gradually progressed towards its current borders and communication infrastructure based on a strong belief in the unbreakable union of the 15 Soviet republics. It was assumed that their eternal interdependence, especially with the republics of Central Asia, would form a seemingly natural bond owing to their historical and geographic proximities. As a result, numerous segments of the borders, in some cases disputed, were never delimited, nor formally demarcated. This case still remains incomplete, and while several land borders have now become impregnable, the formidable Oxus and the medieval Amudarya has gradually become a convenient buffer zone that separates the now fertile Uzbek steppe from the desolate, unbroken expanse of the Turkoman Desert. So uh, now I have uh, essentially a scenario of some slides, of uh, some maps that I put together in terms of how we can study, how we can map conflict and change.
And some of these maps are based on pre-existing maps, but some maps were built completely new for this particular project. So the first one showing you the Amudarya Basin and its extent, covering Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. The, ship, the second map showing you the quantified flow of the river and the extent of water that is removed uh, in wet and the water that actually finally reaches the Alal Sea, which is now largely devoid of water. The third map sh showing you the potential risk factors uh, along the river and all, all of those little uh, notations showing you the kinds of risk factors. Some of them are about pollution, others are about the way in which water shortages will compel certain standing crops to die. Other factors include increased salination of the soil and issues of water sharing. And finally, a very large issue is the way in which microclimates get changed over time. This one, which actually shows you the way in which certain strategic uh, sites have been actually set up along the river, uh, including hydropower stations, uh, gas explorations, and other industries that will, in fact, that are in fact sucking the lifeblood from the river itself. Particularly interesting here are the reds, which are there on the northwest of this particular map, that show you how the bed of the Aral Sea has now become a site for investigation. So, in some ways, the dying Aral is actually a commodity that is being sold. And finally, long term and short term environmental security issues in the Amudarya borderland and putting them all together at this visual level. So when we have water resources, we have cultural continuity and biodiversity, we have geopolitics, we have global change, and we have pollution. And then of course we have some uh, pre-existing factors like Afghanistan with, because of its instability. Within this re regional scenario of challenges, now each Central Asian country is only able to communicate with some other parts of its own country via its neighbors. Uzbekistan's eastern Falkana Valley is the most intricate example of this border patchwork maze, where lifestyles have traditionally been based on intensive trade, agriculture, communications, and pilgrimage to sites encoded in the cultural memories of the people versus the divisions created by political borderlands. In effect, there is an urgent need to encourage cross-border access among the region's citizens whose common territory was once the continuous landmass of Eurasia, including the Amudarya within a system of riverine access points, which I have shown to you. Today, the two states in question, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, literally hold the Oxus borderland as a thickened buffer zone, deeply impacting the cultural and historical continuities of this region. Few locals can even approach the river, designated now as a no man's land, for several miles on either side let alone view it as a permanence connected to their historical identities. In the last several decades, this perceived crisis has only increased owing to the contentious sharing of water resources from the Amudarya River, its decreasing discharge, affected basin, and the creation of deteriorating ecological conditions that prevent further reconciliation. So I just decided to put this collage together at the very end which brings up the scenario of what the river was and what the river has now become. And three ways of looking at the river, uh, looking along its flow and looking towards Turkmenistan and looking towards Uzbekistan. So the one looking towards Turkmenistan is on the left, along its flow is in the center, and towards Uzbekistan is actually on the right. John Prescott's monumental study of boundaries explains, quote, Buffer states uh, have been constructed on frontiers where two strong neighbors decide to reduce the possibility of conflict between them, end quote. I ask, if then indeed the Central Asian nations in mention fall into this particular category, do they indeed risk imminent conflict? If not, should boundary or boundedness be now restated under the rubric of territoriality to allow this historical riverine demarcation to re-emerge from the shadows as Eurasia's historical lifeline. Should the Amudarya not be reconnected to the extra-large, XL, 
geohistorical system that was once an intrinsic part of. And I would like to thank the people who made this presentation possible, Lucille and Benjamin. Benjamin is sitting right here, and Benjamin shall travel with me uh, in two months' time to Central Asia. So, uh, and we will be there for some time, we'll come back, and we'll continue with the project. chatting with Morgan during the break, and uh, he, we were talking a little bit about uh, his, 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 yeah, the comment about uh, meeting people who can, um, uh, who can populate those, those transdisciplinary spaces that are needed to deal with some of these wicked problems. And uh, I think it's part of this transdisciplinary challenge grant, we, we talk about our research, and I think part of the greatest thing about this is the way that we're kind of conceptualizing the way we can educate our students as well. Um, and it, it kind of got me thinking because we said, we, we sort of what, are, what are some of the, tr the, the, the characters that, that um, sort of both inhibit and also promote people being comfortable in those transdisciplinary spaces? And, and it got me thinking that to some extent, I think these start very early in your life, and I was thinking about myself in terms of my, my uh, being the eighth of ten children and, and, and being able to sort of resolve some of these issues around the, the dinner table. And uh, it got me thinking about my mom. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on campus before, but I'm actually a legacy at UWM. My mom graduated from the teaching college here in, in 1936. And uh, so, so the Ivy Leaguers of you are legacies. I'm a UWM. <laughs> um, but it, one, of the things my, one of the things my mom was fond of saying is, you know, don't worry about answering questions. And finding answers is easy. You know, the, the hard part is coming up with the right questions. And this has been a real a treat for me because uh, working with Manu and Ryan, uh, I really been challenged to to really question the the issues that I've been dealing with for for many many years uh, differently, and, and really approach my science. Sort of a new light, so it's been very energizing for me in that regard. I am a, a, a fish ecologist by training, evolutionary biologist by training, and over the years have become increasingly drawn into uh, sort of transdisciplinary type projects. Partly because using fish as the the boundary object, and I don't mean object as a physical object, but an object as, as sort of a means of negotiation. An opportunity to to bring people together to develop meaning uh, around things like boundary concepts, things like sustainability, ecosystem services. So I find myself in these types of settings where I'm kind of asked as the fish person to sort of use fish as as that 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 boundary object as a way to to develop these transdisciplinary communications. And these transdisciplinary communications can be truly between disciplines, but they can also be between very very diverse cultures. Uh, and and I. The work that I've been doing with Manu and Ryan, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail. I, I, I want us to get us into discussion. But I just want to touch on a few of the key points that that I think have really been seminal in the development of my thinking. One of which is this whole issue of boundary objects. I've been working uh, again on this whole concept, of the boundary concept of sustainability, as as the ecologists kind of looking at these traditional three pillars models, uh, where you you much like. Uh, was discussed in the regulatory field, you're, you're in, the, in, in this sort of trade-off paradigm where, where we're really looking at how to give up something in order to get something. And, and through a lot of the process of, of looking at sustainability in terms of the socio-ecological system, you look at this as a longer-term process by through, the, through the, 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 the mechanisms and the meanings that are negotiated, in my case working with, with fish or ecological integrity, you, you change that trade-off conflict paradigm into something that's much more, as an ecologist, systemic. And again, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a historian, I'm not a sociologist, but I think largely of, of, of 
about sort of cultures growing within environments and evolving within environments and then economies sort of evolving within those cultures. And, and that, that sort of nested paradigm is much more the way I've come to think about the work that we do. The second, which has grown uh, both out of our conversations but also of the work uh, with Rob and Karen, is, is that when you get into these trans transdisciplinary settings, and I think about this more in terms of the educational programs that we have to are challenged to, to create, to train the next generation of, of students who can function in these arenas, it, it is how do we define the types of knowledge that's functional in these zones? And, and this is where, where for me, the, the, the real rubber meets the road in terms of, of the, the, the educational system, where, where I, as a, a natural scientist, a mathematician, is very comfortable dealing with sort of the empiricism, again, dealing with confidence at the 95 or 99% level, where, where I can deal with these mechanistic models. But at the same time, when I'm working in Romania, or when I'm working you know, uh, in different cultures, or when I'm working with attorneys versus economists, uh, people who believe that the world is 10,000 years old as opposed to you know, billions of years old, you, you, you're, you're wrestling with very different belief systems. And, and again, working with the functional knowledge, not trying to convince people that my way is the right way of, of seeing knowledge, these different metaphors of knowledge and ways of knowing become really, really quite, quite interesting. So, so part, again, of the transdisciplinary challenge grant is that I've been able to look back at my work and reframe the questions in fundamentally different ways by thinking not so much about me being right as an empiricist and trying to prove with 95% confidence that this is my truth, it's looking at what is the functional knowledge that needs to be negotiated uh, through these processes, through these spaces, through these different examples. In the case here, uh, I've been working for many years. I, I'm a native Wisconsinite uh, as well. And, and over time, have really used things, for example, with sturgeon uh, as, as one of these boundary objects because sturgeon, the 240 million years they've been around, live to be 150 or 200 years, their, their lives are, are really integrating. And what you find is there's very different cultures uh, within, for example, a very simple system like, like North America within the Great Lakes where sturgeon can, can actually bring um, people, they, they care about them. There, there's a value system there. So in, in the case of Wisconsin and the Great Lakes, sturgeon restoration has been a, a real driving force that allows things like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to gain traction because it can be a, a, a context within which priorities can be established and values can be negotiated in a, in a very simplified way, but in part it's kind of the old axiom, you know, it's good for General Motors, well, it used to be good for the USA, um, but that, that whole idea that it, it, as, a, as a flagship, as an ecological flagship, keystone species can work as a way of dealing between these transdisciplinary areas. At the same time, it can be quite controversial with respect to things like dams, uh, with respect to things like fish passage, and dealing with things like power, and dealing with things like invasive species, and the <laughs> conflicts that, that go along with that. Um, since uh, uh, shortly after 9-11, I've been spending uh, a lot of time working in uh, the Balkans, and in the Balkans, uh, over time, uh, I've, through a variety of different uh, projects, um, I've been uh, increasingly involved as an English-to-English -English translator. Um, and, and I mean that in a very, very, really, um, in, these, in these countries where you have 12 countries speaking 10 languages, when they get together, <coughs> they're speaking English. And when I, as the fish ecologist, had earned enough trust from the governor of the Danube Delta Biosphere Reserve, uh, I was asked to be one of the representatives for Romania in many of these negotiations. And, and what I found myself having to do is, is, is having worked enough in Romania and, and knowing enough of the local languages to at least get a understanding of the flavor and the cultures, you realize that when you get into these meetings where there are Ten different countries speaking. They're all speaking in English. They're in their second languages. They're they're, they're saying things, but they're they're not really processing. The meaning is somehow lost. And and I don't mean to say that they don't speak English well. They speak English incredibly. But you can tell that a lot of the subtleties of that meaning. And, and I found myself 
and, and this is entirely just, again, probably from, 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 from childhood, getting into sort of what, what my wife is, is a uh, suicide counselor does calls reflection therapy, where you, you say back to people, paraphrase back and forth. And, and over time, you start to you realize that so much part of this transdisciplinarity is just telling the architect what they just said, or telling the sociologist, or, or, or part of this is just kind of getting back and forth to really understand that somebody heard you, and, and they're, it's a building, of, it's a trust, trust sort of building relationship. So, so that's been kind of the fun thing, kind of working with the Germans and what they think about, about say, uh, 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 about, about Sturgeon. And um, one of the projects that, that fortunately um, has, um, I somehow I've lost my screen here. Um, well, I'm going to escape out of this maybe. Um, well, you're seeing just parts of it now. I've got the wrong, I've got your screen on my screen. Is there a swap screen button that I hit? Hmm? If somebody knows Max better than me, why don't you? Right in the center. Right in the center of my machine or this one? At the top of the screen. Yeah, it's not there. Okay, it's there. Oh, I see, I can see that here. say uh, in my talk is that um, the European Union, as part of Romania sending into the European Union, they had to agree to a whole bunch of things. And these out of a uh, asymmetry in power between a country wanting to ascend into the European Union, they agreed to, to all kinds of things. And the upper Danube countries, Germany, Austria, basically looked at the decline of the Danube sturgeon, five species of sturgeon, and, and kind of blamed Romania for it. Okay, even though they had built the dams, they had polluted the water, they had created all these situations, the, the, the real fisheries cause of the decline of sturgeons was probably stuff done by the upper, upper, upper Danube countries. But they saw that the Romanians were still fishing sturgeon, they saw the black market and caviar, and they basically said to save the sturgeon, we have to ban fishing. And Romania agreed to that, which was culturally totally wrong, culturally insensitive. I mean, there were there. I have pictures here of, of uh, uh, you know, back to the, the Neolithic times, of, you know, over 10,000 years of evidence that this has been such a more part of the culture. So it created a real problem with the Danube Delta, where there's an endemic culture of, of sturgeon fishing. Um, but then the European Union has this thing called network governance, where the network governance is a mechanism by which the countries, there's not really like, in, we don't have like a strong federal government that says this is what you have to do, this is how we're going to regulate. Instead, it's kind of through this process of, of open methods of coordination, where the countries kind of build sort of communication systems by which the different countries kind of collaborate and come up with the sort of uh, policies that are kind of sort of maybe sort of enforced, it's real kind of touchy feely. But the, the Danube, or the, the European Union created what was called the Danube Parks, which is a series of uh, 12 parks across 10 countries, which was actually given an authority to, to sort of regulate between the countries. And the Danube Parks, much like our national parks, adopted this concept of flagship species, of which the sturgeon species were one. So suddenly we had a, what you call a boundary setting within which we could use a boundary object, the sturgeon, to deal with the boundary concept, which was sustainable management of the Danube. So we entered into the system of, of these countries where we, we, we formed together a, it was a, a period of, of two years, where we put together this transdisciplinary, trans-country, trans-boundary restoration plan for the species of Danube sturgeons. And it's still in the process of doing this. And a lot of, there are a lot of different cultures, a lot of different stories you can tell about these negotiations in the process. But what was the fundamental, um, I guess I was laughing at myself because I used my Mac so I wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if I had the slide to show you. 
Uh, what the, but the fundamental problems was that as we worked together, we put this beautifully constructed, transdisciplinary, multi, really great project together. And when it got moved from, from the Danube parks and it went to Brussels for, for funding approval, the bureaucrats looked at it and they said, there's not enough concrete actions in it. So they denied funding because the concept of the funding was supposed to fund concrete actions. That's what the funding RFPs, request proposal said. So even though we had a beautiful project, the transdisciplinary communication of what was a real action had not been communicated. The idea is that what we mean by doing something. When I go to my colleagues, they look from biology here, I'm my grad student, okay. My colleagues, they look at what I'm, they, they, I'm not doing biology. They don't consider me a biologist because I'm not doing something concrete in biology. Okay, the same way as geographers would consider me a geographer because I'm not, well, what is geography? <laughs> That's the whole question. You're never going to geography. My daughter's doing a geography master's in Africa, and she said, geographers just talk about what they do. It's a continually defining what geography is. So, you know, which is it's valuable, because that's in some sense what we're trying to do with, with, with this. So what was interesting to me was that even though we got the, the countries and the scientists and the cultural all together to put together the plan, the next level then is to figure out how that can be then written into the, the, the policies at the government. So that's where that project is right now, and, and kind of related to that and back to the functional knowledge is the other outcome that's come of this is, is help me as a UWM faculty member do a much better job in terms of incorporating these transdisciplinary constructs and, and, and pedagogy into the, the new courses that we're developing for the Masters in Sustainable Peace Building, which is intended to somehow get students prepared to do it. Thank you. 
is focus on ways in which we can actually start, in some ways, writing the fourth chapter. Uh, and like you observe that we are doing our own thing, but there's one more which is more, it's, it's about the way in which we all come together. And that's something that we have sort of written a bit, uh, and we presented it at Kriyas, uh, but we, we have to revisit that. There was, uh, we were, I was approached after our, we gave these talks and a, a cover paper in Trieste, and I was approached after that by one of my colleagues who they, they started a new journal on uh, intercultural communication and environment, and and they've offered us one of the one of the issues to publish it. We chose to publish it. And, and last but not the least, we were also thinking about Robert, and I have a share which I believe is on my shirt. I share it with you. Um, <laughs> I, I've been looking at all the humanities we're now at a stage where we have a mature project, and it might be worth our while to actually see if there is a possibility of actually presenting this as uh, you know, one of the things that Sarko does. Mm -hmm. And of course, this will have to be written in a proper way uh, and set to three or four such institutions, but that could be a, a good way to uh, share our work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was the question I was going to ask. If you would consider co-writing something that explores methodological issues of scientific research. Has that been of interest to any of you? Or? No, that's actually very interesting. And, and it will need a, it will need thought, and it, it's actually something that, personally I feel, and I think Ryan has done it, and Tim has done it, but I have to still bring forth that particular set of lenses, uh, sort of step back. I feel that in some ways I'm so close to the project still, because it's still going on. And I feel like <coughs> a life after it. Um, you know, after this presentation, I'm actually presenting at the Institute for Research in the Humanities in Madison on the 29th, uh, full blown one hour presentation. So it's going to have a lot more information. And you know, some of my students who helped me are all sort of trying to really to go ahead on that. And, and we have all these these bits of information. So this might be actually a good thing to go back and say, what is it, what is the methodological way in which one looks at mapping, for instance? And how does mapping in some ways connect to uh, to issues of, you know, something like you discussed or someone else discussed in this particular context? In some ways in my mind, and I confess there, some of the parts of my presentation I'm talking only about myself are Sort of disjointed. There is a part where I map conflict, there is a part where I map landscape, but I feel that I have still not brought them completely together. But maybe that, that's, uh, that's not a bad thing because that means that it, there is no finality and actually the question that I asked yesterday at our Wolverine conversations was in some ways applying to me of when do you know that the archive has given you all that it has given you? I don't think in this case the archive has given me uh, a lot. I think there's a lot out there still. Not only in, in, the, as, in the archive as a site, but in the archive as a repository. Yeah, my, my thinking in terms of writing has largely been directed towards writing additional grant proposals to get more money because mm -hmm. that's really what I think the chancellor wants to see coming out of this. So, so in, in that regard, you know, a lot of our attention has been, or at least my, my attention has been geared towards looking at how these transdisciplinary methods, in many cases, can be used as part of dealing with, uh, as an ecologist, I, I think in terms of, you know, complexity and adaptive systems. So how can we actually take some of the types of methods that I use as an ecologist and some of the methods that are used, for example, in, in, in geography and governance and, and community organization, and, and how can we actually develop a, a better, I don't want to say theory, but a, a sort of operational methodology for, for dealing with adaptive social, I can think of adaptation very clearly in terms of ecological systems, or evolutionary systems, but when you start talking about social ecological systems, humans tend to avoid adaptation, you know, they, they, that, and that's, that's part of what I, I'm thinking about more in terms of the next steps for the work. for 